Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members and guests at IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Today, I am joined by Dr. Nicholas Shazer, who is the professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies. We are trying something new. Instead of introducing you to a course, I'm going to introduce you to an idea. This idea hovers in the background of some of our other courses. It's a repetitive theme of creation. Dr. Shazer does have a course called Israelite Creation in Context, and it will take you into the ancient Near Eastern thought world and some of the specific details found in Genesis 1 to 3. But that is not what we're talking about directly. We're going to look at how themes of Genesis are repeated. Even right away in Genesis, the creation words and images are repeated in the flood story. The waters that were separated in Genesis 1 crash in on themselves in the flood. As God's Spirit hovers over the waters of chaos in Genesis 1, so too do the birds that fly out over the surface of the floodwaters. We're not talking about that either. This week, we are going to talk about themes of creation echoed in the book of Exodus. And there are so many great examples. I promise we will jump through some of those details to show you how amazing it is to pay attention to the details. But first, I asked Dr. Shazer to explain the general connection between Genesis and Exodus. Lean in and enjoy the conversation. Uh, Well, the book of Exodus, obviously, it it follows from Genesis. So just from a basic narratival perspective, what we want to be thinking about is how these, how the Bible functions, what's called canonically. And that is, you know, a reader of the biblical text as we have it today is going to have gone through Genesis and wound up in Exodus. And when we get to the beginning of Exodus, even the first chapter, we see uh, echoes of what we heard in the first chapters of Genesis. And so it's pretty clear that the writer or writers of Exodus want us to make those links to Genesis and in particular the creation story. So for instance, uh, the first command that God gives human beings on the sixth day after creation is for them to be fruitful and multiply and increase. Well, the same terminology appears in the first chapter of Exodus when the Hebrews are enslaved in Egypt. And despite their slavery, it seems that they're thriving. And in fact, the Hebrew is exactly the same. It says that at this time, the Israelites were uh, you know, being fruitful and increasing and, and multiplying and filling the land. So right away, we get shot back to Genesis chapter 1 in the first chapter of Exodus. So I think it's incumbent on the reader then to use creation themes that we see in Genesis as a kind of narrative framework for understanding what's going on, uh, if not in the entire book of Exodus, at least in the first 15 chapters, which is the narrative of the, the actual geographical Exodus from Egypt. And I'm excited to talk about some of those specific things in those first chapters of Exodus. But what do we see as the entire book is unfolding? So aside from just a a clue or a hint in the very beginning, what about Exodus is creation like? I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the formulation of the world and uh, and so, yeah, what is what is the book doing that is similar to what the creation narratives are doing in Genesis? Great. So that, that is a that's a wonderful point. Is that the the narrative contexts of Exodus and the beginning of Genesis are quite different, and and what we get from Exodus is, you know, little phrases, words, sentences that remind us and echo Genesis. But quite right, Cindy, the the those words and phrases and echoes come in a completely different context. In fact, I would venture to say it's perhaps the exact opposite context. On the one hand, you've got the first human beings who are made in God's image and who are given 
free reign to to rule, to uh, to kavash, to subdue. We can get back to that uh, phrase in a bit if you want. But it's this idea of kind of human oversight over a free world. And once we get into Exodus, we get the same terms that we see in Genesis, be fruitful and increase and multiply. But we get it in terms of Hebrews being enslaved. The, the exact opposite scenario is that God's people suddenly don't have free reign or freedom in, in the earth. They can't exercise those God-given gifts and commandments. So it, it's 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 narratively ironic. But what we need to be doing is having our ears attentive to those phrases and try to parse out how that Genesis language is functioning within Exodus. Because uh, sometimes it functions in a completely different way but it's doing so for a very important theological purpose. One of those ways, probably the most uh, fundamental way is in the presentation of the plagues that God sends, the 10 plagues that God sends. Now the question would be why 10? Why not seven? So seven is the number of completeness in the Hebrew Bible. There's a reason that God works for six days at creation and rests on the seventh day because the number seven equals perfection, completeness. Uh, what about three? Three is the number of a, of a climactic event. Um, Jonah is vomited from the great fish after three days. Hosea famously says that after three days, God will raise us up so that we may live with God. Uh, on the third day, God comes down onto Mount Sinai uh, with Moses and gives the Torah. Mm, there's no surprise then, or it's not a coincidence that Jesus is in the ground for three days before he's raised from the dead. So why not three? That would be perfectly fine as well. That is the symbolism of seven and three is fine. Now, what's interesting is you add seven to three and what do you get? Ten. Uh, and, and so what, what the Bible wants us to do is put those two numbers together. So what we have in 10, the number 10, is this idea of creative power on the one hand, which with seven, that's God's creative power at in Genesis chapter one. And then the number three is something climactic is going to happen. Uh, and so the, the very number of 10 is preparing readers for understanding what's going to happen in the Exodus narrative. Now, um, 10 also functions as a recollection of Genesis chapter one, which uh, in which God says, well, I should say the, the Hebrew word vayomer, which means, and he said, but it's it's with reference to God speaking. So we're all familiar with this narrative. God speaks things into existence. Um, God, and God said, yehi or, vayehi or, let there be light, and there was light. Well, there are 10 instances of and God said in Genesis. So there's no coincidence here that there's 10 plagues. Why is that theologically important? Because for every plague in, in Exodus, God is actually undoing what God had done in creation. If you want, Exodus is displaying the negative inverse of God's positive creative actions in Genesis chapter 1. Is that supposed to mean that for, so God separates light from darkness and dry ground from the wet water? Is that the exact undoing, or is it a little bit vaguer than that? It's God says 10 times, and then there are plagues that rain havoc on the Egyptians. Or can we actually one-to-one -one parallel what God said, the order of creation and the order of the plagues? Uh, so that's a great question. You can't exactly one-to-one -one parallel. That is, uh, well, I should say, I should back up. You can indeed parallel these the, the God's creative actions with the, the plagues that God sends you can there's a one-to-one -one relationship between these however it's in different order so for instance what do we get at the beginning of Genesis I just said it you know yehi or let there be light and there was light and God Elohim eta or uvein hachoshek, that God separates the light from the darkness so you'd expect maybe that the plague of darkness would be the first plague then, um, but it's not. It's like the penultimate one before the deaths of the firstborn. So it's in different order, but but just notice that one of the plagues is darkness, is, is choshech in Hebrew. And that's exactly what God combats with the light of, of Genesis 1. So God infuses light into the world in order to separate from the darkness. 
But in the plagues, God sends darkness. Thereby, it's the exact negative inverse of the work that God had done in creation. There's a reason why the last plague is the death of the firstborn. What's the last thing God does at creation on the sixth day? Create humanity. In the, in the plague narrative, God is taking that humanity away. So there's an absolute one-to-one comparison. It's just that they're not necessarily in the same order. I'll give you, I'll give you one more quick one. Let's go to the first plague, which is the, uh, the, the Nile River and then all of Israel, uh, Egypt's rivers, um, w- water sources, even the cups that they're drinking out of become tainted with blood. And there's a really interesting um, phrase that Exodus uses, and that is that the Egyptians saw that all their, quote, pools of water had been contaminated with blood. Well, the word for pool there will be uh, familiar to some of our listeners and our readers. Uh, it's the Hebrew word mikvah. Uh, it, it, uh, it to, in modern Judaism, a mikvah is a pool of water in which observant Jews immerse themselves in different ritual contexts. Um, and it comes from kava, the, the verb which means to gather, or to pool together water into one place. And that's the exact same word that is used when God separates the seas from the dry land in Genesis, that God pools those waters and the, and the pooled waters God calls seas and the non-watered area God calls dry land. So even the same language, the same phrases show up in Exodus, except here in the first plague, it's a, it's a almost destruction of that clean, separated, organized water system that God creates in the first chapter of Genesis. It's a, it's an undoing of creation. It's a, it's, it's, it's actually a, a better way to put it might be to say, look, what does God do in Genesis 1? God creates order out of a messy world. Um, what God is doing in Exodus is taking that ordered world that God created and making it messy. Some of those things you only really get when you're looking at the original language, which is something which is fun, even for the students of IBC, you don't even have to do a whole entire course to get some of these tidbits because you write about this. Our faculty is writing these articles and there's fun little tidbits of how the language helps you read the text better that we get. Um, I'd like to ask, since you were talking about the plagues, several people have probably heard about the plagues, maybe not the creation connection, but that the plagues were associated with Egypt's gods. And you have an article where you talk about the eighth plague in particular, the locusts, I think it is locusts, that cover. And then we often have in English something like the face of the earth or something like that. But you bring out not only the this conflict with an Egyptian god, but also this creation narrative context. I'd love to talk more about what you see in the eighth plague. Yes. So... Uh- in terms of the plagues being a response to Egypt's gods, that may sound strange, particularly for Bible readers who are, uh, you know, grow up in Sunday school being told that only one God exists in the universe. So that's a little bit tricky. That's what's called monotheism. But the the worldview of the Bible is not that only one God exists in the universe. Rather, uh, the biblical authors um, believe in a in a world in which many gods exist, but that their God, the God of Israel, is the best God. This is what scholars like to call henotheism, um, or sometimes it's called monolatry, but that sounds too much like idolatry to me, so I tend to to stay away from that term. Uh, Henotheism means that there are many gods that exist, but one God is worthy of worship. One God is the true God, or oftentimes in the Bible, you'll notice that the God of Israel is called the Most High. This is a very common name for God. And it's one that modern readers just kind of skip over without thinking too much about the implications of the, of the phrase. Because if God is the most high God, that means there's more than one God out there to be higher over. A most high God, if one God exists, it's, it's I don't know, uh, I would say a useless phrase, <laughs> a meaningless phrase. So the, the idea in Exodus, as, as everywhere else in the Tanakh, in Israel's scriptures, and I would also venture to say throughout the New Testament, um, is that, that many gods exist, and the God of Israel is the most powerful and the one truly, of, truly worthy of worship. And sometimes the God of Israel has to militate against other nations' gods. Well, 
Exodus 12, 12, which is a very easy verse to remember. It can be a memory verse for, for anyone who wants it. 12, 12, which says, God says explicitly, this is not the narrator speaking. This is the God of Israel speaking, saying, the reason that I sent these plagues and, and got you out of Egypt is to execute judgment on Egypt's gods. It's very, very plain. And so what that offers us is this idea of looking at each plague, everything that God does there in terms of revenge against Egypt's gods. And one of the most interesting instances of this is uh, when the locusts come, God sends the locusts. And Cindy, as you noted, oftentimes it's like there were so many locusts and they covered the whole face of the earth or covered the face of the land. Now, English translators know good and well that that is not what the Hebrew says. What the Hebrew says is that they covered the eye of the land. It's just that a lot of English translators don't, A, don't really know what to do with that, and B, realize that that sounds weird to to contemporary English readers. Like, what does that mean, covered the eye of the land? Well, if you look into Egyptian theology, Ra is a very important deity. This is the deity associated with the sun, really the chief deity of, of many historical phases of Egypt's history. And so Ra is associated with the sun. And in certain Egyptian texts, it actually says that the sun itself is the eye of Ra. So the notion is that through the sun, the god Ra is looking over the whole of the land of Egypt, observing, you know, watching over Ra's people. And so when the locusts blind the eye of the land, they are, for lack of a better way to put it, the god of Israel is giving Ra a black eye. They're they're in a boxing match, and this is round eight or whatever the plague is. Uh, and but when you when you take away what the Hebrew actually says, it, it undercuts the project of the of the narrative in Exodus, which is again Exodus twelve twelve to execute judgment on Egypt's gods. How better to do that to the chief deity Ra than to cover Ra's ability to see Ra's people? <laughs> It doesn't actually take, you don't have to be a scholar in hieroglyphs even to realize that. It's just, you can just Google Egyptian hieroglyphs and Ra is going to be there somewhere. Uh, That's right. He is everywhere in the Mm -hmm. hieroglyphs, depicted as like a flying disc or at the top of a pyramid or something like that. Yeah, good. So yeah, that disc imagery, uh, we we get that for Ra and the disc is the disc of the sun. Um, and so, yeah, that, that um, you know, it's I always think it's kind of funny that, you know, the Hebrew word for Ra means evil or bad. Uh, and there's, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of historical things you'd have to, to pull apart to get to the bottom of that. But I just find it kind of funny, at least from a narratival perspective, that any ancient Hebrew reader who's reading the Exodus narrative knows that the word for Ra would mean bad to them. And they also know, certainly the authors know, about the existence of Ra and how important Ra is in the Egyptian pantheon. Okay, so numbers are important, but maybe they don't symbolize what we think they do. Take the number of days recorded in the creation text— In the first three, God creates places. In the next three, he populates the places with what will flourish there. On the seventh day, God rests. There's a tremendous theology packed into these verses. But I know Dr. Shazer has written a couple magazine articles that are published on our website. I asked him to take concepts from those magazine articles and explain what the number seven means in this narrative and what we sometimes miss out about God's rest. The number seven in Genesis is functioning to symbolize uh, perfection or completeness. And the number seven functions in this way throughout Israel's scriptures. If you just go to a Bible search engine and type in seven and you rummage around in the context of where that word is coming up, you'll see that seven equals completion, seven equals perfection. So on the one hand, narratively, numerically, we know that the seven number is not coincidental. It's being used to make a specific theological point. And what's very interesting about this is seven not only function in other ancient Near Eastern cultures as a number for perfection, but it also happens to be the number that shows up in what I would call temple building narratives in the ancient Near East. So 
we talked about the fact that many gods exist, but the ancient Israelites only worshiped the one most high God. Well, indeed, it, the Egyptians had their own temples. The Israelites have theirs in Jerusalem, ultimately, long, long after the time of Moses. But, you know, the Canaanites had temples, the Syrians have temples, the Assyrians have temples, the Babylonians have temples. So that's just a, a ubiquitous reality in the ancient Near East. And oftentimes, Though the physical building of the temples, of course, would take much longer than seven days. When it comes to the narrative, to the retrospective narratives of how the temples are built, these narratives tend to, or often, portray these temples to the gods being built in a seven-day period. One of the most famous examples of this is the so-called Baal cycle. Baal was the chief deity of the Canaanites and other related cultures. Um, These are Israel's neighbors. Baal shows up constantly throughout Israel's scriptures. Even even in, say, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is accused by the Pharisees of casting out demons by Beelzebul, which is just a Greek rendering of Baal Zavul, which means exalted Baal, most high God of the Canaanites. So Baal as a deity shows up in the New Testament as well. And in, in the Baal cycle, this poetic story of Baal, it talks about the creation of Baal's temple. And it just so happens that it takes seven days for the creation of this temple to occur. That's not a coincidence. This is a temple building narrative. So when we go back to Genesis with this, with this truth that this is how these ancient temple building narratives were portrayed, we see something very important. What's God building in seven days uh, in Genesis 1? It is not a temple. It's not a single temple in a single city in a single nation state in Mesopotamia. It is God functionalizing or creating the entire world. That has a polemical bite to it. The writer of Genesis 1, the priestly writer of Genesis 1, is saying that, yeah, these other gods may have their little rinky-dink temples in Babylon or Nineveh, but our God's temple is the entire world, that God fills the entire world. I mean, this is why you get in something like Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah sees God filling the temple, like this 80-foot presentation of God in the temple, where even the robe of God fills the, the temple. The seraphim, these divine beings, are, are chanting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The entire earth is full of God's glory. Well, every ancient Near Easterner knew that their God dwelled in their temple and filled the temple with glory. What the ancient Israelites are saying is our God is so big and wonderful and powerful and awesome that our God fills the whole world. And that is our God's temple. I love that part of the creation story that is missed so often in the retelling of it, but really highlights like when God rests, it's not this sleepy God. It's a God enthroned over all of nature. And you're like, that is such a dynamic ending to a story. That's true. It's so yeah. great. I love it. Yes. I think um, I think it might be John Walton, who's at, at Wheaton College, who has a wonderful book called The Lost World of Genesis 1, has done a lot of work in this creation narrative. It says something like, when God rests on the seventh day, it's like, how like a president might rest in the Oval Office. At least you'd hope that a president would get to work after being uh, elected. And and that's kind of what God is doing. Like God's resting, but yeah, but like Cindy, you said being enthroned. That's a great way to put it. Resting on one's throne with this kind of omnipresent view of the entire world. And since we've ended up talking about, oh, so many numbers in this episode, I thought we should end with a more significant number. And this is the number of people who came out of Egypt in the Exodus. It's sort of the elephant in the room, right? Nick's response was slightly different than where I thought he was going with it, but I really like it. The text says in Exodus chapter 12 that that all the Egyptians, that there were like, 600,000 adults plus children. It kind of depends. There's some there's some uh, manuscript and translational issues in this that I'm not going to go into. But for our purposes, um, oftentimes that that term, um, you know, 600,000, it's translated 600,000 men. But I think it's much better understood as 600,000 adults and, and then children along with them. So either way, the number that we get for the the people coming out of Egypt 
is 600,000. Now it's really interesting. And in Hebrew, there's a, there's a little particle at the front of the number 600,000. And it, that's a, it's what's called a cough. It's just one letter. And a cough at the start of a word means about 600,000. So that is, it's not a precise number. And I always ask students, why do you think 600,000? And if it's about, and if it's not precise, why not about 500,000 or 400,000 or seven or 800,000? Why about 600,000? Well, we've seen that all of this stuff in the Exodus narrative goes back to creation. Well, we've got 600,000. The number six needs to be throwing us back to day six of creation. And what happens on day six? The creation of humanity. So why is the writer of Exodus citing that about 600,000 Israelites came out? Because this is a new creation story. Now it's not the creation of the first two humans. It, you know, perhaps could be even seen as an even better creation. It's a 600,000 version of day six because it's the creation of God's special people, the nation of Israel. Uh, why that's important, A, it's a wonderful theological linkage. Um, and it shows, again, it really undergirds this idea of Exodus as a new creation narrative. But at the same time, a lot of people get caught up with that number. And they say, well, if there's 600,000 men, and again, I, I think that we can translate that term that is usually translated as men as adults. But even so, okay, well, that, but there's more than 600,000 people. By some counts, it's something like 2 million people. And, and, and archaeologists, God bless them. And even you know people who are skeptical of the Bible who do YouTube videos in their mother's basements, they, they read that number and they go, there's no way that amount of people could have come out of Egypt and wandered around the wilderness and what we don't have any archaeological evidence for that. And there's no way they would have made it out because the Egyptians wouldn't have allowed that. And it would have been a logistic nightmare. Could you imagine all those people? And I just want to say, let's take a deep breath here. The, the, the authors of Exodus are artists. They're doing theological art. And then, again, the number is not precise. It's about 600,000. Why? Because it's kicking us back to Exodus. It's trying to make a theological point about the greatness of this new creation. It is not trying to show you some precise historical number about the amount of people that came out of, out of Egypt. So that is that line about 600,000 has nothing to do with the historicity of Exodus at all. It doesn't certainly doesn't devalue the historicity of Exodus, but it's also the, how about this in the Bible? Most often the numbers that the biblical authors use have a much deeper meaning than the digit on the page. That's something that, that readers have to understand or they will miss the beauty, the art, the theology of the Bible. The numbers gives very specific numbers, you know what I mean? Like 178,064. Right. Why not do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but, if we, but if we see the, the, the plagues as this undoing of every day of creation and then a rebuilding of that creation, who should, be the, who should be the ones who are rebuilt? Who are the humans in this story? It's the Israelites. And we're going to take that one step further next week. Until then, go have fun poking around through the magazine articles on IBC. I will warn you, it's a source of many rabbit holes. If you love conversations like this, join us at Israel Bible Center, where you will have access to many amazing courses that dig into the details of culture and interpretation. You can even earn credit towards Israel Bible Center Certificate Program in Jewish Context and Culture. Thank you, Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing an amazing job editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related. Bible-related.